Thank you all for coming to the auditorium, although it's a beautiful weather outside. Um, we are really happy to have uh, Kendall Gears here, who will present um, parts uh, or his work that he uh, is showing at Manifesta, and um, I hope you enjoy. Thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me? Is this working? Yeah, is this working? All right. Uh, thank you all for being here. I'm going to speak about my work for Manifesta. Um, there it is. Uh, but of course, you know, it's like getting to know strangers, getting to know people. I'm not sure how many of you may be familiar with my work or how many of you may be familiar with why I ended up making this sculpture for Manifesto, which opened a couple of weeks ago. So I'm going to take you on a small journey, introduce myself, introduce some of my thoughts, and try to help you to better understand why I arrived at this particular conclusion. So I will get to the sculpture at the end, but I need to take you on a journey first. Um, this is a bronze sculpture. It's an eternal flame. It's, um, it's tires which have been cast, used tires, rejected tires, so basically tires that were sent off for recycling. And they were cast in bronze, and there's an eternal flame on the top. So it's a monument um, called Fired Up. How does this work? Ah, wait, all right. So let's get the art history stuff done very quickly. I mean, of course, you know, the Rauschenberg um, sculpture with the tire, the, 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 um, the, the very important happenings, um, Alan Capra, and of course, Bancuzzi's Eternal Column. I mean, these were, of course, references, art historical references that I think one would be able to take for granted with an educated audience such as you are. Um, and of course, the most famous of all is the um, bicycle wheel of Duchamp and the magnificent quotation in which he described that um, he made it because when the wheel was turning, it was just like looking into flames. So now that we've done the art historical stuff, let me go back to introducing myself. Um, this is an extremely important work for me. It's called The Terrorist's Apprentice. I made it in the year 2000. And of course, we start with the match and we end up with the flame. And I'm going to explain why and how that journey took place in my life. The reason why this is an important work is it was an exhibition I had at the Palais Tokyo in the year 2000. But it was the culmination of an entire year in which I produced nothing. I exhibited in the space of the Palais Tokyo the single matchsticks, matchstick in a vitrine and nothing else. The show was called Sympathy for the Devil, and the work of art is called um, The Terrorist Apprentice. I made it, the, the work I had made prior to The Terrorist Apprentice was this piece, which I made for um, Sonsbeek. And what you don't see was the performance, and what you don't hear is the sounds coming out of these speakers, which was I had decided, or for various questions or various conclusions I'd made at the time, I was interested in the question of power, power within the art system, power within language, po how power manifests and how power is structured. Um, and of course, coming from South Africa, which I'll get to in a minute, these questions of politics and power and aesthetics and ethics were extremely important to my practice at the time, which was a largely political practice. And given the nature of the curator of Sonsbeck at the time, Jan Hut. I decided to make a work of art which was very specifically a portrait of Jan Hut. The work is, work is called Truth or Dare, Jan Hut. And what it comprised was I organized with um, the local community in Sonsbeck, in Arnheim at the time, because the, the call for the, um, that particular exhibition was the curator wanted us to work with the local community, work with the the regional politics and the history of that community. So Arnheim was an extremely important city in the Second World War, a site of many battles, a site of a lot of conflict. And the person in the local community that I worked with was a dominatrix. And what the work involved was a private performance in which Jan Hut was sent to this dominatrix to be tortured, to be whipped, to, be, you know, to, to, to reverse the role of power, male, female, artist, curator, to subject this man of power, Jan Hut, to a different curatorial process, a different aesthetic, a different ethic. What you hear are the sounds of Jan Hut, 
coming through the speakers. You don't, I, there are no photographs, there are no video documentation because it wasn't about being sensationalist, it was about addressing very important ethical questions. But having done that, I said to myself, where do I go to after this? Where am I gonna go to as an artist? Where does this political question, where is this political question take me? Of course, at that time, South Africa had already, been for, had already started to fall apart. The post-apartheid um, uh, honeymoon was already over. The corruption was settling in. The nightmare of what South Africa was eventually to become was settling in. And I was having very serious, deep questions about the role and function of politics and the role that an artist could have. And I needed to take a year off. I needed to take a sabbatical to take time to think. That's something we don't do in the art world. We don't take time. We don't take time to think. We don't take time to think about more important issues, spiritual questions, questions about being human or inhuman. Uh, um, so the terrorist apprentice, the nature of that work is it's a single matchstick in a very large space, and that's the, the work can only be exhibited on its own. It can never be exhibited along with any other work of art because it's about space. It's an extremely small wooden object that commands a lot of, for me, spiritual as well as political questions. And of course, it's an important homage to Silda Marilessa's Southern Crossing, Southern Cross, which is a small piece of wood from the Amazon. And this work has to be exhibited on its own within a certain um, amount of space. And of course, well, go back. Now, of course, coming from Brazil, this question of the Southern Hemisphere is an important one for Sildo, and it's an extremely important one for me as a South African artist. As an artist who grew up in South Africa, as a white person who grew up in South Africa, po posing this question, who am I, what am I, and what is this world that I inhabit? Now, this is a very interesting and important map of the world because this is technically how the world really looks. Africa is a lot larger. South America is a lot larger than the images that we generally um, are presented um, because, of course, from the Northern Hemisphere. The Northern Hemisphere was enlarged and the Southern Hemisphere was made smaller in order to focus attention on economic and political priorities. But from the world I come in, come from, it mo looks more like that. I mean, why would we put North on the top? Why not South on the top? Why not a different image of the world I was born into? which is a very strange world, it's a very perverse world, it's a very complex world. In 1652, this man, Jan van Riebeck, arrived in South Africa. And I'm sorry to give you this history lesson, but in order to understand who and what I am, I need to backtrack to introduce why I think the way I think. So this Dutch man, Jan van Riebeck, went to South Africa in 1652, and he declared South Africa to be a Cape Colony, a, a, a colony of the, the Netherlands. And, of course, that started a whole journey which was known as colonization, and the world ended up, we know the, the, the consequence of um, the Dutch colonization of South Africa. Now, this work is me as a little boy in June 1976. It's a work I made in 1990, it's a very small work, of course, the photograph is me as a kid, and the text I added June 76. It's a small Polaroid. Um, and this is a work I made in 1990 when I was reflecting on this question of becoming an artist. It was my journey of entering into the world of art, entering into the conceptual languages of the international traditions, trying to find a way to relocate myself within these um, ways of seeing. And this work was a homage or a reference, a political reference to, of course, this image, which I'm sure you all know, which is the, today, 36 years ago, Soweto exploded on fire. On the 16th of June in 1976, the townships, specifically Soweto, erupted in fireballs and protests, and it turned extremely violent. And it was the turn of events in the history of the fight against apartheid because it turned violent. This was the day when the police opened fire on protesting children. The children were protesting because they said, we don't want, and they used the, the, the Pink Floyd song, we don't need your education, we don't want no thought control. 
they refused to be taught in Afrikaans, because that had been at the time the official language that, well, everybody was being taught, but especially the black community, as part of the instrument of apartheid. What happened at the time for white kids is that the government introduced in, 19, in June 1976 television. And of course, they introduced Dallas, and they introduced, what was it, I think, rich man, poor man, soap operas. They introduced soap operas, and it was a very good example around the world of how television became the, literally the opiate of the masses and drew attention away from politics. And Soweto was burning, but the white community didn't know it. The same year, I also, no, the, uh, this is a work from 1993, which again is a reference to a very specific reference to Hector Peterson. So in 1973, uh, 1993, in the build up to the first South African election, so apartheid ended in 1990. And in 1993, what happened was the old apartheid government, who was not in power anymore, and there was negotiations and discussions in the, in the building of a new constitution, in the build up to a democratic election, they decided to try to get rid of evidence. So they were sending a lot of papers and information that, that could be used against them to be destroyed. And I found this specific object, which is one of the most ominous found objects in, I think, the history of found objects, is the death register from 1976 from the Johannesburg morgue. It was sent out for gar to garbage, and I managed to, at the time, this is the way I was working, um, uh, intercept and transform this work of art, this object into work of art. And what you see on the, if you see the detail on the left-hand column, the little red R's, those were the names of all the victims of the Soweto riots. This is the only known object which documents the names of all the deceased from the 1976 riots. So, why am I telling you all of this? I'm telling you all of this because my life is inextricably intertwined with politics. My life is inextricably intertwined with the value system that I believe in. Ethics and aesthetics are very much the same. And this was the, the perverse upside down world, the perverse upside down country that I was born into. To give you an image of how white South Africa was able to exist and how apartheid was able to exist for so long, without people realizing it's a, that was a crime against humanity. So here you have, from 1978, a letter written from a teacher in my school. And I'll read it to you. It's, Dear Mr. Gears, it's a letter that was addressed to my father. I refer to your letter dated the 13th of uh, the 9th, 1978, and wish to express my sincere thanks for your attitude. As you well know, we as teachers seldom have the sort of backing we re require from parents. And it was so pleasant to receive a letter from one who still believes that a good cane on the bottom serves the purpose of a thousand or more lines. I thank you once again for your sensible attitude and assure you of my best attention. Oh, I made a spelling mistake. As far as Kendall is concerned. Corporal punishment, this militarization of the imagination, this militarization of society was the world I was born into. As a young child, we were sent out marching every Friday. We were taught how to shoot guns. We were taught how to be paramilitary. We, were en we entered into the world so that by the time we ended up at 17, 16, 17, when we entered into the real military to go and fight in Angola or to go to Soweto and engage in a very active um, combat, a very hot war against our fellow citizens, we were already militant. So the story of this letter is I was misbehaving at school, and I had been caned. And at some point, my father had seen the welts on my backside. And he was so impressed that I had these welts that he wrote a letter to my teacher saying, thank you for taking such good care of my son. The teacher gave me the letter and asked me to return it to my father. But on the way home, I opened the envelope. I read the letter. I was so disgusted and so outraged by what he was saying that I think this is probably my first work of art. I decided not to deliver the letter. I think this is my first consequent act of rebellion against the father, the state, the church. A, an active act of rebellion which broke a cycle of events, a chain of events, which perhaps not realizing at the time that not delivering this letter was a work of art, 
but it opened my mind to the possibility of other ways of seeing, other ways of being that you can say no, you can resist. Um, so, Um, we're missing an image. Ah, oh, yes, there it is. All right. What's this thing is moving by itself. I promise you I'm not making it move. Let's go forward. All right, I have them in the wrong order. So in 1988, so two years before the end of apartheid, when I was still very much thinking in terms of politics and trying to understand, um, it was the same year when I made the, the transformed the letter to my father into a work of art, trying to understand how my identity had been constructed because being anti-apartheid during the time of apartheid, being part of the anti-apartheid um, struggle as a white person, you're born into a world, and, and very much so when you see from the letter that was addressed to my father, very much rejecting my family, very much rejecting everything my family stood for, rejecting my teachers, rejecting my church, rejecting the state. You're born into a world that is illegitimate. So you become very conscious that your identity is illegitimate. You become very conscious and aware that what you are is identityless. I had to then embark on a journey to try to recreate who I am, because where I was coming from, that line from Jan van Riebeck, through the history of my family, I was born Jacobus Hermanus Peter Geers, the name of my father, into a working class Afrikaans family. Changing my name to Kendall was another political act. Changing my date of birth was a way of reclaiming my birth by saying, I refuse to accept the identity that I've inherited, but try to forge a new one. But how are we formed? How are we created? So this is a work with a tire that was obviously from 88, one of my own references with, to the burning tire monument that I made. And on it you have this poem, Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a nigger by his toe, if he hollers, let him go. Clearly a very racist um, poem. Where does it come from? It's a process of elimination, you know, the game that children play, Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, uh, you're out. And I chose the tire for this particular work of art, because in 1988, at, in the political state of high apartheid, um, deep apartheid, Winnie Mandela made the very, very famous statement saying, with our tires and with our matches, we will liberate South Africa. This was a call to street justice, mob rule. There was a, it was a process of, now this is a very famous photograph from Kevin Carter, um, who took these photographs of one of these mob lynchings, where literally they would, people would pour gasoline, pet petrol, into the tires, put it over somebody, and set light to it. They did that because once the tire caught on fire, there's no way to put it out. It was guaranteed death. People were doing this all the time in South Africa with tires at that time, calling on Mande uh, following the advice of Winnie Mandela, this kind of mob justice. Um, there's me as a very young person, the same year I made the tire sculpture, being arrested, another photograph of Kevin Carter um, when I was at university. Um, South Africa was a place of these kinds of flashpoints and conflict, going back all through the history. The idea of the fire, or the idea of fire, um, was also part of my consciousness as a South African, because here you see an image from 1890, the Anglo-Boer War. It was the first trench warfare in the world was the British against the Boers in South Africa. And they had a policy called scorched earth. There were two, Bo there were two wars from the British against the, the Boers. The first, they lost, because they went to South Africa in their red uniforms with the white um, leather belts. So they were sitting ducks for, for the, the snipers in the, in the trenches and in the mountains shooting them. They came back the following, they came back a few years later with, with a scorched earth policy. They, start, they started on the one side of South Africa and they burnt the country all the way through to the other side and in the process set up the world's first concentration camps. And this was the first time in the history of the world that barbed wire was used in a military context against humans. The first time that barbed wire was used as a weapon. 
So, of course, in 1990, it all changes. And Winnie Mandela, we know that the, the, the marriage doesn't last soon after Nelson Mandela is released, and maybe Winnie Mandela goes her own way. 1990 was the end of the Cold War, another end of a grand ideological scheme that fell apart. Um, and in 1990, I returned back to South Africa because I had been forced into exile because of my political um, involvement and decided to be part of the new South Africa to try to make a difference, to try to build this new country from the bottom up, believing in the new um, democracy, believing in everything that the new South Africa had promised. And I made this very symbolic gesture in February 1990 when I came back, which was as a white person who had been part of the apartheid struggle returning to South Africa with this very big question mark of identity. Who am I? And I know I can't go back to my father. I can't go back to being Afrikaans white trash. What am I going to do? And so I took blood out of my arm and in a symbolic gesture tried to wash myself, tried to wash myself with my own blood. And of course, the more you wash, the dirtier you get. Uh, the work is called Bloody Hell. A few years later, I made this work, which is called Portrait of a Young Man. And of course, there's the, the reference to James Joyce, but of course, the portrait of the young Mandela. And it was a work I made, which again, like the Jan Hood performance, it's a work that is not, the actual performance is not reproducible because some things should not become images. Some things should not become spectacular. Some things are best preserved as private performances. And what the private performance was, so after having washed my blood in 1990 and trying to figure out my space in the Rainbow Nation, and I always said I was the black hole in the Rainbow Nation, trying to find a, an entry point. I was in Berlin in 1993 or 94, and there was going to be an exhibition of South African artists being opened by none other than Nelson Mandela. We were asked, we were given the opportunity to have a private meeting, to have a private audience with Mandela. What do you do when you meet a god? What do you do when you meet somebody who stands for everything that you have believed in, all your faith, all your hope, all your dreams, a person for whom I went to jail, a person for whom my friends were murdered, a person for whom I went into exile, a person for whom a great many millions of people in South Africa were believing in and giving hope in. What do you do when you meet a god? a living God, a very real person. And I was reflecting upon this idea of, in giving birth to myself, in starting again, who and what I am, trying to understand what is it to be African? What is it to be white African? Because I am an African. My ancestors have lived in South Africa for 300 years. I am African. And I was thinking about traditional African art, the classical African art. So this is a photograph which I, so when I met Mandela, this is how I was dressed. He walked up, he saw me, he laughed, he said, I know who you are, and he shook my hand. And it's a tongue-in-cheek joke on power, but it's also very um, paying homage, and I'll explain. So the photograph eventually I took in a flea market in downtown Johannesburg, and you see me sitting there on an, a, a fake African chair, and in front of me you see these fake African masks on the floor. So what is the difference between a fake African mask and a real African mask? And the difference is, imagine 200 years ago, somebody in a, in a village in the middle of Africa carves two masks. The one mask is immediately put into, and the masks are exactly the same. You can't discern the difference between the two in terms of quality. You take the one mask and you put it in a vitrine in the Pompidou Museum, and you leave it there for 200 years. The other mask is used ritually. It's used in the dance, it's used in the performance. It's used in the process of being used, it gets a patina. It's baptized with blood, sperm, sweat, hair. It's being used and it gets marked, it gets scratched, it gets the proof of being used, it gets this patina. Now, the interesting thing about the performance in the cultures for whom those traditions were living is that when the person was wearing the mask and dancing, in the mind of the person and in the mind of everybody else in the audience, they didn't say, oh, there's John dancing with a mask pretending to be the god of rain. No, they all said, that is the god of rain. 
It, it was an embodiment. It wasn't a metaphor. It wasn't a representation. That was the God of rain. It was a possession. So everybody understood the importance of the mask in the ritual because the object was part of its culture. Part of it, its use was connected deeply to the faith of the people who inhabited that particular village. Now, fast forward 200 years. The mask that was used and has the patina and the sweat and the sperm and the blood and the hair, that's the authentic work of art. The one in the vitrine is considered fake. In African art, it's not the age which makes it important, but the use. So, of course, putting on the god of Mandela to meet the god of Mandela made perfect sense to me. But in the question of asking myself, how do I define myself as an African artist, I started this question of trying to link myself with the world I'm living in, try to link my, my heritage, my morality, my ethics with the world I'm living in, and construct my art out of the byproduct of the life that I was living. I'm going to go quickly through the, this. Um, construct my identity out of a lived experience. So 1995, I made this work. It's the only work I ever made called self-portrait. Although I've made a number of works of art using my image or using my body, this is the only one called self-portrait. And I think it's probably pretty evident, but um, I will go through it. Um, so of course, the most important thing you see is imported, not the word Heineken. Not the word from Holland or the original quality, no, but imported. Because growing up in South Africa, as growing up in many per peripheral places in the world, let me just check the time. Yeah. One has a deep sense of insecurity, a deep inferiority complex that whatever is imported is obviously better than whatever you are. Because whatever's coming from the outside is surely better than who you are. And this, imagine this object was designed in Amsterdam, filled with Heineken beer, perfectly designed beer, then exported around the world, imported into South Africa. It has a function. It has a design. It has a place. Everything is thought through. Everything is, meant, is as it was meant to be, much like the Dutch settlers going to South Africa in the 17th century. You would open the beer. You drink the beer. The function is lost. The beer is being consumed. The object is no longer useful. It gets tossed aside. Um, at the time when I made this, I was thinking about this, this question of South Africa and identity. And I was very, very fascinated by the ability of kids to take a can of Coca-Cola from the garbage, cut it up, and make a car out of it for the tourist trade or for themselves, to be able to recycle the garbage of Europe, to be able to recycle the garbage of things that no longer had a use. But also ideologically, I was interested in the ideological recycling of objects, the, ideal, the ability to, to change the way we perceive a very simple everyday object like a matchstick or a broken bottle and shift the meaning in order to make it more magical. And I do use that word specifically now. I'm not afraid to talk about magic and spirit because that's the journey that, that's the conclusion I came to with the terrorist apprentice back in 1990. But in this day, I was still afraid to think in those terms because it's not popular in art. I was thinking more in terms of politics. But so this object, the empty beer bottle, not only is it empty, it gets broken and tossed aside. It's, there's nothing you can use this for, except for things that you shouldn't be using it for, the dark side of human nature, the dark side of what we are. It's an object for me of extreme pleasure and extreme pain because I've always tried to strive to make works of art that are attractive and repulsive, like the scene of a, a car crash. You drive down the road, you see a car crash. What makes you stop and look? You look at the broken glass. You look for the blood. You're attracted because something perverse inside you wants to see the blood because there's something life-affirming about saying, I'm still alive. There's something that, that attraction repulsion, that kind of, it's a very complicated, contradictory, um, state of way of thinking, and so I try to strive with my work to construct that contradictory pleasure and pain. So the pain, of course, is you know, I always find it fascinating when on an aeroplane you're not allowed to take knives or, or nail clippers on an aeroplane in case you're going to hijack the aeroplane, but they serve you wine in a bottle. 
You take that bottle, you smash it, you have one of the most violent objects known to the human animal. Any football hooligan knows very well what that's used for. And it's, 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 it's an extremely primitive and yet universal weapon that the modern urban animal, the modern urban human is capable of using. And in South Africa, and in many parts of the third world where marijuana is extremely cheap, they also use it to smoke. It's called a big pipe. So it's an it's a object in South Africa of extreme pleasure and extreme pain. OK. Um, yeah, I was, I, was, I was going to talk about the journey of trying to, it was around about the time of 1995 when I made the self-portrait that I started this process of trying to reinvent myself, trying to get away from my heritage, trying to get away from what I was. Now what's interesting is this is the old apartheid flag. And if you need any clue where South Africa comes from, you have inside the Union Jack and you have the Dutch flag. I mean, South Africa is this very strange contradiction of English and Dutch culture. And it was at that time that I also started a work of art called this TWCV. TW is an abbreviation I started to use, which is short for title withheld. Instead of saying untitled, I use the, the, the system title withheld. And my CV starts on the 6th of April, 1652. Because, and it goes through, I've, I've, I've just there um, reduced it very quickly to um, a couple of dates, but it's a list of dates that come before I was born. It's a list of dates that continue until, this, until the present. And my CV changes every year because some things become more important and some things become less important. Suddenly now I, I might be reading a book and I discover that in 1786, Goethe joins the Academy of Arcadia in Rome. And there's something I'm thinking about spirituality and literature, and that becomes an important date. So I'm going to add that. And maybe at another point, my thinking is going somewhere else. So I'll remove that from the CV because identity is fluid. It's not something that's fixed. It's not something that's predefined. It's something that I can enter into. And it's for that reason that I decided to change my date of birth to May 1968, which then brings us more closer to the present and the monument uh, for Manifesta. And I asked this question at some point, what do you believe in? Um, do you, do you believe, is, it, is it the police, the state? Is it art? I recreated the exact spiral of um, Bruce Nauman's work from the, the late 60s, because back in the late 60s, the true artist was helping the world by revealing mystical truths. When I walk around the Basel Art Fair, I see cynicism, parody, and irony. I don't see any mystical truths. It makes me very depressed. It makes me very sad. What happened to sincerity? What happened to artists being able to enter into the world of spirit and speak about things that are important to the world rather than pandering to an art market? And of course, searching for who and what I am Remember in 1976 was the protest against Afrikaans. I am Afrikaans. I made a choice to stop speaking Afrikaans as a protest. I decided to speak English as my, take my second language and make it my first language. Um, but what is this thing called language? Um, I don't know if I have time to go into it. Um, but just very quickly, on the left you see a work of mine called Song of the Pig. And it's a, it's a long tunnel with four, there's four entrances, two short sides and two long sides, and it's a crossroads. And you can enter into the, the corridor, it's like, it's, it's like a, um, a, a hospital, three meters high, 1.5 meters wide, and you have on the, wall, on the walls bright orange body bags. You have 60 body bags that you then inside, they're open. 60 body bags are not, they're, it's the scene of a major crime, it's an airplane crash, it's something traumatic. And the reason why they're orange in South Africa is because a lot of those kinds of disasters were happening in the gold mines. And in the gold mines, you don't want to have a black body bag. You want to have something that you can see in the darkness. So that's why they're orange. But the work of art is a homage to a man called Gerard Sekoto, who in 1948, so the same year apartheid was, was made official, he made this painting called Song of the Pick. And Gerard Sekoto eventually left South Africa, and he ended up in Paris, and he's South Africa's Van Gogh. Um, he died in poverty, quite forgotten, um, was later rediscovered. But the Song of the Pick became an extremely important historical anti-apartheid work of art because what you see is 
the black people working with their picks, digging holes in the road. And on the right, you see the white guy smoking his pipe. And the theory is, or the mythology was, or the, 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 um, the way white South Africa perceived these working men was that when they were singing, they were working better. They were when, that when they were working, doing this hard, manual labor, if they sang, it made them better workers. And indeed, the singing was definitely giving them energy, and indeed, they worked much harder. But what the white guy didn't realize is that they were singing protest songs in Zulu, because he only could understand English and Afrikaans. He didn't understand Zulu, and they were singing about liberating South Africa. They were singing protest songs saying, things are going to change, this is going to end. And the fact that the limits of his language were not able to extend to be able to understand the language of the people singing, he completely misunderstood. So the limits of your language are very much the limits of your world. And I will go very quickly through um, the, the language works, because we don't have the time. But I've made a lot of work thinking about this question of language, because where does language come from? And very briefly, we know language comes from the Tower of Babel. So at some point, our ancestors, now this is a universal story across many, many cultures. Our ancestors were building the Tower of Babel. Some artists have interpreted it like this. It may well have been the pyramids. We don't know what the Tower of Babel was. But God or the gods, depending on which story you read, became threatened and decided to prevent us from completing the Tower of Babel by introducing the confusion of tongues. So one day, everybody woke up and was unable to finish this tower. So in, like that, we started to speak Zulu, English, or Afrikaans, or French, or German. Which leads me to make two very interesting conclusions. One, language is divine. It's coming from God or the gods. And two, it's a curse. So language is a divine curse. And for that reason, I'm very preoccupied by the fact that in these neons, the word terror becomes error, border becomes order, danger becomes anger, slaughter becomes laughter, and so on and so forth. All right, so this is me more recently. And this is, um, I've made a lot of works within this question of trying to understand traditional South African art. What is, what is it to be South African? I've made a lot of work with razor mesh and razor wire. Because going back to the Boer War in 1890, the first place in the world that barbed wire was used as a form of conflict in, as a weapon was in South Africa. But during the time of apartheid, um, the South African, a South African company called Cochrane Steel invented this thing called razor mesh or razor wire. You all know what it is because it's all over the world now. It's these blades. Instead of, um, unlike barbed wire, once razor wire attaches itself to you, you get stuck. You can't escape it. It pierces your skin. And it still has the world patent, this company. It's a very uniquely traditional, specific South African material that I work with um, trying to wrestle with my history, my identity, and try to ask questions about spirits. So this is a work of art called House of Spirits, which is based on a Leonardo drawing, Leonardo da Vinci drawing, and you see the detail there. So there, there, there's the, the, the Leonardo drawing, and of course the title is from um, Isabel Allende, asking this question of spirit, asking this question of transcending into something more important, spiritual. Um, and of course, in now moving towards the column of tires, I'm um, going really fast. I don't know if anybody, if you're all keeping up. <laughs> um, so moving to the column of tires, asking this question of justice. I, I wanted to know, um, so here we have very important buildings around the world, libraries, um, courtrooms, where, in which the column is extremely present, because the column is there to link heaven and earth. This is the way that we are able to communicate between the different realms of the gods and the humans. Um, and this is a work I made called Acropolis Now. So there's two versions. There's the, the simple version, Acropolis Now, and then there's Acropolis Redux, um, the director's cut, where I was using these columns of razor mesh 
to pose the contemporary question of contemporary justice. And what is it that links modern day humans between our earthly world of politics and a spiritual world um, of something more profound? And the razor mesh, this horrible symbol of what it is that we're capable of doing to fellow humans. So the title of Acropolis Now is, of course, a pun on Apocalypse Now, the film, which is based on the, the, the book Heart of Darkness of Joseph Conrad, um, in which you have Marlowe going up the river to fetch the renegade Kurtz. And as he's going up the river, you have a sense that he's going into himself. The shadows are taking over. The river's turning into blood. And by the time he reaches Kurtz, he's become a sympathizer. He's actually reached the point where he starts to understand what Kurtz became. And growing up in South Africa, I'm very aware of that in every single one of us is the capacity to turn evil, the capacity to turn against humans, the capacity to all of us become Kurtz, to make this transformation into something very ugly and violent if we let go of more important, um, let's call them spiritual questions. Um, what is it that makes the human being set fire to Joan of Arc? The other two images, they're not necklacing. The other two images are, in fact, self-immolation from Tibetans protesting, using fire as a protest against the Chinese occupation. I think that's... This is the... This is the world that we're living in today. A violent world consumed by fire. A violent world consumed by fire of exploding oil wells because of irresponsible drilling. Um, people setting fire to themselves in, in protests. Um, on, the, on the right, you see a work of mine called Homage to, no, it's, it's yeah, Homage to the Unknown Anarchist. It was an eternal flame of a burning car. And on the left, obviously, uh, protests. Um, which led me to last year, I had this exhibition in Beijing. And I made these resin sculptures called Flesh of the Spirit. And they were on these oil drums. And these were me trying to give image, trying to give expression, trying to, the, the flesh of the thought of what is going on in the world. The, 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 the animals drowning in oil in the Gulf of Mexico that suddenly, at some point, it's not in the news anymore, so we stop talking about it. So suddenly, because there's something else in the news, the problem has gone away. No, the problem hasn't gone away. The problem is continuing as the world is melting down, as the world is falling apart. And what are we doing as people? What are we doing as artists? Because I think today it falls upon artists to speak, because everybody else is castrated. Everybody else their balls are held by the captains of industry, by the presidents and the popes and the, the money. Because everybody else doesn't have freedom of expression. Even whether it be cinema or whether it be the music industry, even those artists don't have the freedom to speak up against what's going on in the world today. But we do. Artists do. And we can. So when I was invited to, I mean, I like this, this, this Hopi Indian word, Koyaniskatsi, life out of balance. Um, that's what we're living in, life out of balance. Um, and there's this need to bring the heaven and the earth, to bring them together, to unite them, to find a balance between the creative and the destructive, the positive and the negative. And there's just a few other columns that I made. Um, I'll speak about this work quickly because I showed this last year in Art Unlimited, and some of you may have seen it. It's a work which I made in 1993 originally in South Africa during the time of the, the political time. And it was at that time a question of thinking about politics because in South Africa it was used, people would suspend rocks from under bridges over freeways as a form of protest. And what would happen is as the cars would just go speeding on the way down the road, they would hit the brick, and it was a very inexpensive bomb um, that anybody could afford. It was a form of, 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 of uh, terrorism at the time. And I made a work called Hanging Peace. 
But last year, when I presented it in Basel, you know, from 93 until 2011, many years had passed by. But I realized that the work is still relevant today because as you enter into the work and you make your way through the bricks, it's very safe. You can push them, no problem. You can run, you can throw those bricks, and you can get through without any harm coming to yourself. But the problem is, the person behind you is going to get a brick in the face. It's not dangerous for you. It's dangerous for the person behind you. And for me, that became a great metaphor for the world today, that we've been rushing through the world irresponsibly, but the people coming after, and I guess we are the generation today who are, who are getting the brick in the face from our parents and grandparents. And trying to reconfigure my thoughts as an artist and the space in the world, I was less interested in the physical fires of burning anarchist cars and more into the question of spiritual fires, baptism by fire, and understanding that in the microcosm is the macrocosm, that we are interconnected, that when you push the brick, it comes back that you can't isolate yourself from the world you're living in, that as I cannot isolate myself from the history of my ancestors or the fact that the languages I speak were injected into me by my parents, we're all connected, we're all part of it, and decided to make this um, monument of the burning tires. So it's, of course, a reference to the, um, the necklacing taking place in South Africa, the burning tires, but Genk was also the city where it takes place was the site of um, a huge motor car factory, a Ford motor car factory. And the site of the, um, the exhibition is an old coal mine. So trying to bring together the, this, this question of the fossil fuels and the coal mine and then the, 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 the motor car factory, I thought it would be, and then bring in my own um, personal history to create this column, this tower linking heaven and earth in a spiritual way with the flame on top. I think there might be questions for one or two, time for one or two questions. <laughs> Let's see. Are there any questions? How do people respond to your work? This one, for instance. Well. The, the thing about art is that you can never really predict a response, and everybody takes out of it what they are able. Um, I always, tr as I used to think art should be like this, a car crash, I also now think art should be more like a seven-course meal, so that there's enough to take what you need from it, so that you don't get to the bottom of it. And of course, on the first degree, people respond extremely amazingly to fire. They stand around and they put their hands up and it becomes this very strange pagan monument reacting to fire in exactly the way as Marcel Duchamp described it, this attraction to the fire. And for me, that's beautiful because the work is trying to speak about other ways of seeing, other ways of being. And I think that the audience was responding with their unconscious or responding with a nonverbal way, reacting to the warmth. And then, of course, if you start to um, decode or digest the work on, a, on an intellectual level, and you start to, to see the process of the relationship to the Ford factory or the, or the fossil fuels of the, the coal mine. Um, on an intellectual level, you get a different level of meaning. And in, yeah, there's it's, it's no way of saying there's a correct or an incorrect way of responding, but the responses were quite positive. I don't know if it was because I spoke too much or too fast, but um, thank you all very much for coming.